welcome back to our 2017 educational webinar series. I am Dr. Jill Brooks, Senior Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, a hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We continue our March webinars focusing on the topics of contracts and services. We are so pleased to have Todd Sexton, CEO and Director of Identelect Technologies, presenting cybersecurity double jeopardy, HIPAA, and state encryption requirements. A seasoned professional, Todd has over 20 years of experience in managing dynamic business organizations. Over the past 10 years, Todd has focused on HIPAA cybersecurity compliance and the change business requirements. He's been involved in creating and developing innovative email security applications as well as championing, championing their adoption across organizations of all sizes. Todd leads a team of compliance professionals. Identelect Technologies creates secure solutions to protect critical information with an emphasis on simplicity. Their aim is to make high-performing products which are easy enough for anyone to use. Their delivery trust service is the simplest, most cost-effective end-to-end email security solution on the market today, specifically designed to keep small and medium-sized businesses current with regulatory compliance and maintaining the business-client trust relationship. A copy of the handout is available for download in the control panel. Feel free to submit questions uh, during the presentation uh, in the question box on your control panel. Your Paycom CU certificate will be emailed to you from Paycom following the broadcast. There is no need to request it. This will take a few days. Additional CU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. Go ahead, Todd. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, and thank you so much, Dr. Brooks. I appreciate all the, the effort that you guys put into doing these. It uh, really provides a fantastic service. So um, I, I apologize up front. I've got a little bit of strep throat, so bear with me a touch. My voice is a little cracky, but we'll get through it. Um, so really what we're trying to do is we want to go through, there's so much changing right now. There's so much dynamic change in all of the regulatory requirements and you know we, we almost think we start to get a handle on it right we st think we get a handle on what the HIPAA compliance look like but what's changing is what's affected during cybersecurity and really what does that realm look like well unfortunately we're not just hitting it from a HIPAA standpoint now we're getting involved in straight state regulatory requirements as well and they kind of overlap a little bit and so we'll go down that pathway and let you understand what does that really look like for you and then obviously you know our communication has changed so dramatically and so the electronic format of communication is so critical on how we communicate so we need to make sure that we're very clear on what that information is what's confidential and how do we go ahead and make sure we're protecting ourselves part of that protection it is critical that we understand that the um, the difference in how we're getting breached. What are the what are the fears? What are the, the the vulnerabilities that we run into out there? And that's really what we're going to try to um, go through today. Help you understand so that you know what to look out for and know what flags you want to go ahead and say. Ah, I need to stay away from that, or I need to educate my staff on. Okay, and then we'll go through emailing best practices because that's a very important aspect of this. And then obviously, you know, we're a lot of the reason why we're doing this and focusing on it is because the consequences are very significant, okay? They are really changing the fact of what it is that's required of us. So we're going to go ahead and look at what are those consequences and how can you minimize them and avoid them as much as possible. So obviously the breaches are happening like crazy. Um, we see it to a degree that is unbelievable at this point. I was just at a lecture the other night where the um, FBI were there, ho Homeland Security was there, and it is it is amazing how much penetration it is, is being experienced right now. And really, when you look at those type of organizations, although you know their, their goal is to help us to ensure that they get these criminals off of the road um, so that they're, they're not um, creating these problems for us, 
The problem is, is they're, they're a very small force, and we have a lot of bandwidth that's going on out there. So how do we start to protect ourselves? And that's what we'll go through a bit and see how they're suggesting we overcome it, but also how do we go ahead and protect ourselves? Okay, so let's first hit, obviously, you know, HIPAA's, HIPAA's the granddaddy of everything, and it's going to really guide and shape the way things are being done. Now, obviously, we've noticed in 2016, they took a much different stance, and they said, look, we're going to do open audits, and we're going to really drive down to make sure that we're getting true compliance, because if you look at the statistics, um, and where the compliance actually is, we're still very far off the mark of where we should be. But now it gets more complicated. So what happened um, as of 2017, our states have really upped their requirements as well. So what's odd about this is you can end up finding yourself in a situation where you get a HIPAA violation, but also compounding get a state violation. Now what do I mean by that? So when you look at this, obviously, you know, you, Arizona, California, Illinois, and Nebraska, they said, look, we are taking a very stringent approach. They're requiring a lot of the similar things that HIPAA is, but they're standalone. So when they're actually separated, you could actually get a, uh, a, a HIPAA violation directly, and that's public. So now once that's public, you go ahead and get a, a letter that actually says, Oh, now you're responsible for the state violation as well. They didn't even they weren't even required to do an audit on you because it's already been accomplished. Okay. And you have other states that are following suit. Okay. And so you, you have to really look at this and understand that this is a this is a compounding issue. And if we're not not taking these steps in the first area where we need to with HIPAA, we are going to run into where we're overlapping into other scenarios. And we'll get into that a little bit later into the lecture. Todd, I'm going to pause this here for our first polling question. You should see up on the screen, true or false, HIPAA violations can be levied even if no data breach occurred, with two options to choose from down below. Perfect. Thank you so much for that feedback. I'm going to share it with the group here. Todd, back to you. Great. Okay, so obviously when we're we, we, we need to understand what PHI is, and I'm sure you guys have been through enough classes and enough understanding of really what is PHI and what do I need to protect. We get that, okay? However, when you start to look and you start to really look at individual communications that you make and you say, okay, well, for example, like placing an email address in an email and a name, now you've went ahead and you've compromised yourself if you have not protected that information. So very important that we understand what those identifiers are and that somehow we're having a safety net a place that we're capturing that data and we're ensuring that there's no way that that information is being exposed and that you're not falling outside the protocol because as we will see in a few minutes that can get very onerous. Okay, so let's start going down the guidelines on what you need to follow because these are super important and it'll give you a framework for the things that we're getting ready to go into. So obviously we know the 18 identifiers must be secured. But you also have to have into insecurity. They're requiring that anything in transit must be secured all the way through the path. Now what's happening is through these regulatory requirements, whether it's through the state ones or whether it's through HIPAA, they're also defining what is security because how this started out is they would put a blanket path that security was something to protect, but they didn't define the encryption of it, the access point of it, what that looks like. So understand now they've really defined that regulation so that it's not ambiguous any longer. You have true definition of what encryption is, okay? And then they've taken it a step further. They actually say NIST certified, which is the National Institute for Security and Technology. And what they're doing is that process 
must be certified by then. So realize what's transpiring is the, the, the regulations were fairly loose in the beginning, but as they saw lack of compliance or lack of understanding, they really have tightened things up along this pathway, okay? And so this information, it must be used, the encryption must be used at transit and at rest, and it must be, um, the keys must be protected separately. Now this is a nuance that has changed, okay? This is something that's different today that didn't used to exist. So now HIPAA has not picked this up, but several states have. What's this mean? Because this is an important piece to understand. So previously what we've said is, hey, you use end-to-end -end encryption, you're encrypting all of this data. It is a true safe harbor, right? It's absolutely protecting you unequivocally. However, and I believe that HIPAA will end up picking this up as well. What's transpired is with the state, they're saying, no, it's not a safe harbor any longer. You have to still be able to pr prove that the keys or the process behind the encryption has not been compromised either. So it isn't enough that it's just encrypted. You have to have some sort of guarantee that the keys have not been compromised as well. So it's super important that you start to understand how these nuances shape the way we're looking at the information because if you don't, you will end up falling short and you will end up putting yourself in jeopardy. Okay, and so obviously, you know, this is what going to associate all of the stuff that we're dealing with within the audits, okay, and obviously there's um, substantial fines that are happening and where we'll actually get into is how those fines can actually happen through HIPAA and then how the fines can actually go ahead and move into um, your state as well. Okay, great. Um, so let's go ahead and um, OC, uh, the OCR audits, okay, now this is what's getting us, it, it, it's really changing what's transpiring here, okay. So the first off, the privacy policy, okay, for PHI, you should have a, a complete privacy policy on there, okay. You also must go ahead and um, be able to um, uh, request the privacy protection for all of the PHI that you have, okay? Because understand what's transpiring here is that they're trying to, to limit all access points, okay, for individuals and where that PHI is is being exposed. It's funny, I was in, you know, with my strip thread, I was into the doctor the other day, and it's, there's still really a lot of organizations, large organizations, that are falling short Okay, they're not actually doing the things that they need to be doing to actually protect this information. So you need to be looking at all aspects of your organization, but where we're really focusing on today is the electronic aspects of it because that is really going to change the way you, you train your staff and the way you see the process transpiring. Okay, so the big things that we're gonna focus on right now Okay, if anybody here has gotten that call yet, that audit um, request, so within 10 business days, you're expected to comply, all right? And really what they're really looking at is they're looking at any kind of administrative aspects, any physical or any technical aspects to your organization. And they're, they go through with a fairly fine tooth comb and realize something, and, and I'm a firm believer in this. I do not believe that the OCR is set out to um, be tyrants here in any, uh, any form or fashion. What they're doing is trying to shift the mindset of how we look at information and we realize what the absolute vulnerability is of it and how easily we can be compromised. You know, we'll go into some aspects like social engineering and that will, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be amazed at what's transpired that actually allows us to give up the information that's so critical. Todd, I'm going to pause us here for a brief polling question. You should see up on the screen, how prepared do you feel like you are to receive an audit call from the OCR? With options to choose from down below. And to address our previous polling question, uh, can you receive a, a HIPAA fine even if no data breach occurred? 
The, the answer is yes, and I'll let Todd touch on that after this polling question. Perfect. Thank you so much for that feedback. I'm going to share this with the group here. So it looks like we're feeling pretty good about it, but that's why we're here to learn some more. So Todd, take it away. Okay, so I think one of the aspects was really, can you get fined even if you haven't had a breach? And that's, that's really what this shift is about right now. You know, if you look at whether it was um, state-driven or any other type of regulatory um, body, it was only if you had an incident was was that occurring the problem is is the incidents are too great when you look at um, you know you look back in 2015 38 percent of all medical records across the US breached okay you had 140 million records so when you look at this when you look at the gravity of how much is being exposed they've, they've altered the dynamic of how they're looking at it so the di dynamic now is Let's go ahead and ensure that the information is protected prior to. So if you're not hitting their tenants, if you're not going through the steps that is required of you, then yes, you absolutely can go ahead and experience a, a, a fine. And the level of that fine is really determined on how much you're sticking to um, the adherence. You know, we're all going to have mistakes. We're all going to miss certain areas but I think it's important that we understand that you know the more you're doing the more you're concealing that information the more kindly they're going to look at you and also a lot of that can just turn into apps is as minimal as a corrective action okay as long as you're really trying to um, capture and control all of the uh, all of the PHI in your organization Todd, I'm going to interrupt you here. We have a good question from the audience I'd like to address. The question is, what are the keys that should be protected separately that you're referring to? Fantastic. Thank you. Great question. So understand that all encryption is based around a set of keys. So information that locks and unlocks the data. Okay, so realize that what they're saying is, what they're saying in the change of the regulations that have transpired, it isn't enough that the information was encrypted because if somebody had access to the key, so you said, hey, look, all the stuff's missing in my house today, but um, my, but it doesn't seem like there was any breaking of an entry there. There was, you know, the doors weren't uh, pried open, the windows weren't broke. However, somebody had a copy of your key to your house and they accessed it. So what they're saying is now that it's not a safe harbor any longer unless you can prove that that key has not been compromised. Okay, and so when you're looking for solutions and you're, you're trying to put something into your facility, make sure it's somebody that has safety protocols behind that, that key process. If they do, then you you're you're still back you fall back in that safe harbor zone right you fall back in that scenario that really allows you to say nope we're good we've done what was required of us but if you can't prove that then it gets gray again and now you have you run into um, different aspects of culpability okay so obviously we talk about all these violations and what's happening and obviously we can see they went up Okay, and obviously they're going to keep doing that. They're going to keep getting more expensive as we go further. But here's the thing. Here's what we got to understand is now look, all of your every time you get a violation, it's not always going to turn into a fine, but it's about how proactive you are. And what I take a look at is look at it as kind of a 10-step process. And if you're doing nine out of those 10 steps and the one is falling short, the chance of them hitting you on a category three fine is very low, okay? They're looking for the people that aren't taking proactive action in their organization. But if you are, you know, and, and one of the things like with first, uh, first healthcare compliance, working with organizations like this that really help you guide that path and that process, that's going to keep you out of so much 
problem and so much um, where you're falling into these lower categories of fines. Because realize it can be the same violation with just a higher escalation based on your, um, your care of the information that's there. So obviously, you know, we've spoke a bit about what does it look like for these states, okay? So we, we, we hit on the fact that there's four states that have really taken a proactive stance on it and they said, look, we are requiring that you actually go ahead and protect this information. They define it exactly like HIPAA does. The only thing you'll see different is, um, you know, you won't. You, a lot of these uh, states will only have 15 identifiers instead of 18, and you won't see that same perspective. Now, some of them, like you look at Illinois, they've taken and they said, look, we're going to match everything with HIPAA. And if you look at how all these regulations are shifting, they're we're so decentralized, right? And I and I bring this up because, like, I I deal a lot with European regulations as well, and we as as a country, we're so decentralized. And what happens is, just because you said, well, I had a HIPAA violation, I paid my HIPAA violation, I'm good. That doesn't that ad, doesn't abdicate your responsibility to your state. But realize one thing: if you maintain the standard that HIPAA is requiring of you, you're going to be fine with all your state stuff. It doesn't matter really what state you fall into, you are going to go ahead and be able to supersede that because you're always going to see where the um, where HIPAA is really going to be really enforcing the, the, the limits all the time. So it's going to be super important that you focus on being present with HIPAA and understanding that. So these are just a couple examples of facilities that have gotten, um, that have received both state fines and HIPAA-based fines. It's real, guys. It really is happening, and it's really, you're really falling into this double jeopardy thing. If you stay stringent along the HIPAA path, you're going to be fine. If you're not, then you'll run into this double jeopardy aspect. So make sure those violations can be much more significant than you think they were originally. Okay, so now this is, we're going to kind of get into what I believe is very important for you to recognize and understand about how do I protect myself? There's all these things that are happening out there, but what do I do to make sure that I'm really um, protecting what's happening with my organization and I'm uh, educating everybody on there. So we'll go through phishing scams, we'll go through malware, we'll go through cloud computing. Obviously smartphones is always a big one and um, protecting email communication. So first off, social engineering. This is, it's, it's, it's really has become a, a fascinating interest all in itself because you know, I, I watched something the other day that was, it was so interesting where through just conversation, you can call up an organization or a business purporting you're someone else, okay, emulating another entity or another company or another individual. And now all of a sudden, you can gain access to information that it would almost be impossible to, for you to do it in any other way. So you can bring access to, um, the thing that I watched the other day was interesting. Guy calls up, he's calling an organization, he said, hey, you know, it's late on a Friday afternoon, um, you know, we're changing over your insurance, we want to make sure that your insurance, your personal medical insurance doesn't lapse. I just need you to put in your username and password. I'm going to send you an email. It's going to go ahead. You're going to put your information on the screen. We just want to make sure we're taking care of you so that nothing happens and you don't miss this aspect. So they go through, take two or three minutes. They, they, that was allowing them complete access to that system. Now that individual was able to, that was their playground now, they were completely into that organization. Understand, social engineering is, has become very important now because what it's doing is it's using our um, efficiencies against us. So make sure you're watching out for them. Make sure that you vet the people on the other side of the phone. Make sure you instruct your, your employees to do the same. Okay, so malware. Malware actually started out to be a good thing, but you know, as I always like to say, no good deed goes unpunished. So what's happening is malware we really devised 
for software companies to actually get real world information on their software. Okay, so they really could figure out how are things working out in the field? So how can I better serve you? How can I better provide something to you that makes sense for your organization? Well, the only way to really be able to do that is to know how people are using it. And unfortunately, now we've made that software in a way that it's actually stealing information. Right, so when you look at it and, and you install programs or you accidentally allow things in your computer, you can actually, they're scraping information out of your computer. So how do you prevent that? Look, we all have antivirus, we all have malware. You have to make sure the updates are so critical. And because, you know, I have to give a, a tremendous amount of credit to um, you know, the, the top five or six antivirus spamware protection that you see out there because they're so good and so intuitive about getting stuff out as quickly as possible. You might have a uh, malware or virus come out and within hours they have a fix, but if you don't have your um, system updating automatically or it, it only updates once a week, once a month, you'll miss those and you will fall prey to those and it, it, it can be devastating because it won't be devastating to just your computer. That, those are the kind of things that take down your entire network, okay? Um, so cloud computing. Now this is where things get a little bit more um, confusing because, you know, obviously, you know, you know I, I know that when cloud computing started out, everybody was a little scared of it. They were a little intimidated by leaving their information out there. But now we've gotten a little bit more confident about what that really can provide, okay, and what that can really do for um, our company and what kind of control it gives us over our information. But there are pitfalls potentially. So first off, you know, it is going to, it will improve collaboration, it's going to help you control information, it's going to give you complete access at any point, any time. However, Make sure that, that um, the, the provider that you're using is absolutely HIPAA compliant. And realize, there's two sides to this. Realize that, let's say that you're using an email provider that says they're HIPAA compliant. Well, they can be HIPAA compliant in the way they store and hold your information. That does not necessarily mean they are HIPAA compliant in the way they transmit your information. You know, it's a loophole, right? And they might have another service, and I see this all the time. Well, we have two, for a company, we have two services. One is hosting your email, the other one's protecting it. Um, the hosting perspective, they might give you um, the, the fact that they are HIPAA compliant, but if you're not um, making sure that the transit path is also secure, now you run into challenges here, and now you can really look at being in a, a part where um, you're thinking you're protected, but you're not. So make sure that first off, they're HIPAA compliant, at rest, and at transit, and accessibility. Those are the three main pillars. The other thing you need to make sure of is you do get a true business associate agree, agreement from that organization. If they don't provide you one, if they're not willing to, or if they don't know what it is, go to a different provider. It is absolutely not wise to stick with that type of organization. Todd, I'm going to pause here for our third polling question. You should see up on the screen the question, how do you currently secure your client PHI in email communications? With a few options to choose from down below. Perfect, thank you so much for that feedback. I'm gonna display it up on the screen here. Um, Todd, would you like to go into the difference between uh, PDF password protection and email encryption? I feel like there's uh, some, some blurriness between those two. Certainly, thank you. Okay, so uh, obviously, you know, there was, there was a time when um, you, you had a PDF passwording and there is encryption there in that um, standpoint. You said, it's fantastic, it's great. It really was what was needed at the time. However, things have changed substantially, and why? Because technology has improved so, so much that we have the ability to still access that type of information. Now, when you know passwords are always 
the scary part because if I can actually access that information via a password, then it doesn't matter what encryption you have, I can get past it, especially if it's only a single authentication. Okay, so here's the problem with PDF passwording. So you know when you go ahead and you log into your bank and you you miss the password and you keep forgetting it and after five tries it cut, it knocks you out. Okay, the challenge is, is that it's going to keep um, restricting you and you're gonna only have so many opportunities to get in there. Now, with, PDA, with password generators, if there was no stopping to that, you could keep going through password generating and it doesn't matter how complex the password is, you can get through it. No doubt about it, you can get through it. So, here's the problem with PDF passwords. It has no brain, okay? That PDF does not speak to anything. It's not like your bank where it'll shut you down after so many attempts. I intercept the PDF password, the PDF, it's password protected. I put a password generator on it, and with less than, less than 60 seconds, I will get into that document, without a doubt, and I get that password generator for free online. So realize, those exist, and they're super important that we go ahead and protect that information and ensure that we're actually really going ahead and saying it's true encryption and there are safeguards in place, and, and PDF passwording does not allow that to be the case any longer. Okay, so smartphones. I love it. Everyone's got one. Some people have two or three. Okay, when you look at the amount of uh, smartphones out there, it's unbelievable, and I, I, I marvel at when I'm going into a restaurant now or something, and nobody's even talking anymore. Everybody's on their smartphone, okay? There's real pitfalls with it. We get so used to using it, and how many times we grab onto a Wi-Fi system because you're not getting reception, but hey, I've got to get my communication going. So. Here's the problem is, any unsecured Wi-Fi, absolutely, positively, unequivocally, never use it, okay? It is, there are so often that it is compromising. Even when you go into, if you're traveling, and you go into a hotel, and that hotel doesn't require any authentication, I can put up any kind of Wi-Fi that looks, it emulates, it looks like, um, you know, Hilton Honors too, right? And now all of a sudden you can access that you think it's their, their system, it isn't, okay? And then you're running into a system where um, you will you will go ahead and fall prey and everything that transmits across there is free game, okay? Um, there's a lot of operating system flaws. I realize there's only so much testing and um, that, that can happen. And so some of these, and I'll get into this in a second, but some of these operation system flaws or the way um, software is imparted can cause you issue. And so you need to make sure that you're being as aware, uh, aware as, of any of those updates that you're providing and they're coming from the true provider, okay? Then downloading applications. I, I, I cannot bring this up enough. Uh, you know, if I had to poll everyone on this um, on this webinar and see how many of you actually go ahead and download applications that you, oh, hey, I want to play this game, or oh, this seems like a, a, a good application, L look one day at what they're requiring access to. I mean, they re will require access to your phone records, they'll require access to your documents, to your pictures, to everything, and we're giving that up freely on a free application that we don't even know who generated that application. So realize you are putting yourself at an immense amount of vulnerability when you do that, okay? Now, understand something just happened. I'm not sure. I wrote an article about this a few months back, and Pokemon Go, right? I, I, I'm Still, I'm still amazed by the by the whole process of Pokemon Go. I even one of my employees asked him the other day, what, "What's the what's the drive?" And he was like, "Well, you get to catch stuff." I was like, "Okay, I'm definitely missing something." However, all that being said, realized that what they did is they had made it. Whether this was inadvertent or inadvertent, it was on purpose. We don't really know, but. Um, with the Google credentialing that had happened, what happened with Pokemon Go, when you got a new update, you went ahead and accepted it, and it automatically gave them all 
access to everything you had on Google. Your email, your documents, your photos, all your browsing, everything. It gave Pokemon Go 100% access rights. Okay, that's true that, that happened. And that went on for, for weeks before it got, um, before it was discovered, brought to light, and they were able to shut that down. Okay, that's how simple it is. You don't even know it's happening. You say, accept, download the new application, move forward, and now you're in a world of pro problems because you realize that there is real issues there, okay? And you need to make sure these are valid sources that you're pulling the information from. Pay attention to them. Ensure that you're protecting your information. Um, emailing, okay? Emailing's critical. It's, it's our, most, our most common source and path of business communication. First off, is the recipient a client in any way, shape, or form? Maybe they're a friend too, but maybe they're, they're a client. You have to treat them differently. Does it contain PHI? Well, based on our 18 factors, we already determined that almost every single email you will ever send out of your business will contain PHI. If it has two of those factors, now you run into being able, needing to protect it. Okay. What happens if you send an email to the wrong person? You know, what is that that's going to really transpire with you? So what should you do? So you really need to be able to be utilizing a system that you can retract, okay? Or you can authenticate the recipient so it requires that only the intended person can actually access that, okay? So that's super important. Okay, then when you look at um, when you're, um, if, if a client's sending you, right, then this happens all the time. I hear about it consistently. If you're receiving protected health information, okay, you didn't know it was coming, and that information drops into your inbox and you realize that, that wasn't protected at all. What do you do and what is your liability? Because it's really important that you understand and you don't, you give them the right pathway. Realize that obviously you had no idea that was coming in, so you couldn't have prevented that initial communication. However, I, I suggest multiple things. One, make sure you give them access point from your website that has true encryption coming through it to you guys. Number two, once you've determined they've sent you something insecurely, you are required to contact them and give them a path of security access for you. Now, if you don't and you continue allowing that from that same individual organization, now that's where you do become liable. You do set in a place where you are culpable for what's being transmitted and if that information is exposed. Because we can't expect that all of our clients are going to know enough about the information, okay, about how to protect things. We have to go ahead and provide that to them. Next thing is, is password protecting enough? Okay, obviously we went through it with a PDF scenario. It is not enough. It does not, it does not um, allow us enough protection to, one, solidify what HIPAA requires, but even just a, a simple frame of mind of what you would want for your clients or if it were your own information. Okay, so obviously, we, we know that email, email needs to protect, be protected, but why? Understand that when you send an email, that email can go ahead and make hundreds of stops along the way. And what's happening is we call them man-in-the-middle attacks. And those attacks, what they're doing is capturing information along the pathway. That information is still going to be delivered, but what happens is there's a ghost image. There's an image of that information that's reproduced in the cloud. Now that will last for seven to ten days. In that time frame, what happens, I can go up and I can download a program for free and I can go pick a point in the internet and just scrape that information. They're called sniffers. Okay, super easy. I'm just going to database the information and I'm going to go ahead and sell it. Here's the reality for you. They might not be targeting your exact organization or even that a, a specific email. That does not go ahead and say that that information isn't going to be exposed because they're just capturing information looking for the right pathway. So it's important to understand that. So what do you do and 
when you're looking for and trying to understand what options do you go down, how do you go ahead and make sure that it's simple for your clients and simple for your internal employees, but you can have true enforcement, okay? Understand that a lot, a lot of systems require that the sender and receiver belong in some way, whether that's the recipient to download software, or become a member, or create a username and password. All those items are impediments. Now, we want to be secure, but we also want to maintain our business and go ahead and keep things moving forward. So, when we do that, it's very important that we understand, you know, there are services out there that don't go on these same rules, okay? You also need to make sure that you have true sender controls. You should be, you know, we've, we've accepted the fact that we have abdicated all of our um, control over information whatsoever. We go ahead, we hit send on an email, that email goes out, and all of a sudden, now we don't have any more um, control over that. That doesn't have to be the case. There are ways that you can actually control that information. And then when you look at your organization and you look at the um, IT infrastructure costs and the things that require, are required by a lot of these systems, it can be extremely challenging. Okay, so what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that the system you're putting in place isn't heavy intensive on the back end, okay? And that it isn't requiring a lot from your team. So one of the things that we provide as an organization is Delivery Trust. And what Delivery Trust does is it kind of takes all those worry aspects away. It gives you full control. We talked about control. It says it allows you to restrict forwarding and printing. A full audit trail. Everything that's ever happened in that email, it lets you know that. It also lets you recall that email, even after it's been delivered or read, so that you can go ahead and mitigate um, the, the um, harm that's happened by you go ahead and sending out an email that you, you didn't want to to the wrong person. So you can do that. But then the, one of the biggest challenges out there is ensuring that all the information that should be encrypted is encrypted. So how do you make sure that your employees are doing that? We have a smart scan technology, and that smart scan technology, what it does is it goes ahead and it looks at all the information in the email, in the body, in the, in the attachments, and it scans for any type of information that would fall into that PHI category. Once it locates it and finds it, it goes ahead and restricts it from being sent regularly, and it requires them to send it securely. Okay, so then you have true policy enforcement. You can go ahead and manage the way your employees are utilizing the uh, and sending information. Okay, it is a full seamless integration into Outlook 0365 Gmail. We've provided that so that it really allows you to take control. Implement it into your system. You have 150 users. Um, we'll have you up and running in an hour. That's how simple it is to implement, train, and really design to allow you to take control of your communication path. So, and then you don't have to have your IT department setting the policies. The security panel is so easy that you can set this as the administrator for the entire um, group and you can go ahead and control the information very succinctly. So really what's happened is we provide a 20% discount for um, all of First Healthcare Compliance um, clients, and we've done that because we really value them as an organization and think they've done a fantastic job at providing you um, services and education, and we're really proud to partner with them. So at this time, what I'd like to do is open up for any additional questions that may be out there that I could field. Okay, great. Todd, thank you. Uh, why are we responsible for unsecured data that is sent to us? Okay, what we're required to do is th those individuals don't uh, know what the pathway needs to be, right? So you have a you have your 70 year old grandmother, and she doesn't realize she's sending some information out that needs to be protected. We are required to educate um, and provide a pathway for information coming to us. So any time that, that we see that um, situation occurring, it is our fiduciary responsibility to provide that pathway and to go ahead and achieve that for them. 
Uh, how can I tell if my email provider is HIPAA compliant? Okay, so like, like that gets a little bit more detailed. So what's going to have to transpire is not only do you have to go ahead and make sure how are they housing the information, they'll have to disclose on their terms and conditions if they're HIPAA compliant. That means there's a true access system on how they go ahead and access that information. Okay, so that's half of it. The other half is NIST approved type of encryption that goes back and forth from sender to recipient full end to end. Those are the two pieces you must have, plus you must have a BAA or a business associate agreement. Those are the, the pillars that are required. Uh, we use Google Apps with uh, Virtua. Does this satisfy HIPAA email compliance? I'm sorry, with what you use Google Apps with? It says. Is it saying? Is it saying virtue? Yeah, virtue. virtue. Does this okay. satisfy HIPAA email compliance? Yes, it does. So, so basically, what you have here in that scenario, you have um, Google Apps. Now, what they've said is the way they are housing the information on the back that is HIPAA compliant. Guarantee it. Absolutely, it is. Okay, it gives you the access points to do it, and even if the servers were down, there's another access point to capture that information, and it is protected while it's sitting there. Now, while in transit, you're using a secondary application, would be um, similar to our application, that it would go ahead and protect that information end to end. So you start when it, from the sender all the way to the receiver, and then there's a required um, there's a, a re required uh, approval or acceptance process from that recipient. That solidifies um, the loop that is required for HIPAA. Great. Can it really be determined that a data breach came specifically from one of my email communications? One thousand percent, yes. Yeah, it's um, you have to understand that every single um, every single email, every single data communication has a signature to it, has an access point, goes to an IP address, goes to the link is amazing on how much information you can capture off of that. So yes, absolutely, I can locate that a breach came from your specific email, and even the time, the date, the location, everything. Do we need to use encryption on emails that do not contain PHI? So, um, technically, no. However, where you fall into the gray area now is what do we fit? What did we determine that has PHI in it? So, they, uh, HIPAA has already predetermined the email address is PHI. Okay, that's number one. You have any other individual identifying factor? Now it is PHI. Okay, so so use that as your litmus test. Okay, and you say okay. I just need one thing in the body that identifies that recipient, um, now it's PHI. So is, if it falls into that category, then yes. If not, no, legally you're not required to. Okay. Are the state regulatory agencies also doing compliance audits like the OCR? They are not. Okay, and so that's a great question. So um, they're not doing the audits right now, okay? I believe that will be in the future. However, because they're just ratcheting their way up, they will end up getting to that standpoint. However, understand that they're piggybacking off of an OCR audit. So OCR, get, OCR audits you, it's public, now you get fined based off of their audit. If I suspect a breach occurred, how long do I have to report it before being in violation of HIPAA requirements? Yeah, so it gets a little bit of a sticky area because, um, you know, they have, they have uh, made determinations that it's as small as seven days. However, the reality of it is, is um, the enforcement of that, um, as I've seen to this point, it's a little more gray because it is challenging to always figure out when you received a breach. However, if you knew a breach happened and you don't report that immediately, you're going to, remember when we looked at those, 
one, two, three, and four category of fines, you would take yourself to a one, you'd drop yourself down significantly. So the fines would be much more substantial if you did not knowingly um, turn that information over. There's just a follow-up on the previous encryption question. Can we use things like medical record number and last name, first initial, in an unencrypted message? Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, absolutely not. And just if you could make a comment um, in regard to your system, does this allow email securely from a mobile or from a tar uh, tablet device? Absolutely. So any any place you want to send that email from, whether it's from your mobile device, true end-to-end -end encryption, whether it's from your tablet, your computer, it really allows you to access it from any point and knowing that no matter where you're accessing it from or where you're sending it from, it's the same experience and it will make sure that it's completely secure from end-to-end. -end. Great. Well, Todd, thank you so much. I know you've been, you know, your your throat's been hurting, and I think you definitely pulled it off. Uh, so please use uh, Todd's contact for information on the screen if you have any further questions. If you send us questions, we will forward them on. Uh, your Paycom CU t certificates will be emailed automatically to you from Paycom. Please join us again for our next educational webinar on March 28th, dealing with difficult. EHR vendor issues with Mark Cunningham from Chambliss Law at noon Eastern Standard Time and also March 29th, also at noon Eastern Standard Time, corporate compliance for federally qualified health care centers in 2017 with Kevin Fairley of Fairley Law. You can register for these webinars and also request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at 1sthcc.com or feel free to call us at 888-544. Three four seven seven eight. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day.